Right. Good afternoon. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Margaret Raymond, and I'm the Dean of the Law School here at the University of Wisconsin. And it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to our annual Kastenmeier Lecture. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, this lecture is supported by the fund established to honor Robert W. Kastenmeier, a graduate of our law school who served with great distinction in the US Congress for more than 30 years. Bob was truly a Renaissance legislator who made an extraordinary contribution to a remarkably rich range of fields. And this event is intended to recognize those contributions by fostering legal scholarship and conversation in those fields, which include corrections, the administration of justice, intellectual property law, and perhaps most pertinent for all of us today, the field of civil liberties. We have a dedicated planning committee for the lecture, which is chaired by my colleague Anuj Desai. And every year, the committee really works hard to put together an extraordinary program with a great speaker. And they've really outdone themselves this year. If I may, Anuj and the members of the planning committee, can you give us a wave so we can give you all a hand? Thank you so much for all you do to make sure this is really a rewarding experience for all of us. And I'm also delighted to announce that we are joined today by some members of the Kastenmeier family, Bob's wife, Dorothy, and his son, Edward. I wonder if you'd uh, give them a welcome. It is always such a pleasure to have you home at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, this is, as many of you know, um, my last year as dean here, and so this is my last opportunity to welcome you all in that role to the Kastenmeier Lecture, and that, I confess, has made me a bit reflective about the privilege of being part of this community. I am profoundly grateful to all of you who come together to recognize this remarkable graduate of our law school in the way that he would have loved, with a great conversation with a remarkable lawyer and some of our faculty colleagues about big issues and big challenges. Now, to introduce the program. Our speaker today is Vanita Gupta, President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Ms. Gupta served as Acting Assistant Attorney General and Head of the U.S. <coughs> Department of Justice Justice's Civil Rights Division in the Obama administration. Before that, she was Deputy Legal Director and the Director of the Center for Justice at the American Civil Liberties Union, and before that, worked at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She has a law degree from NYU, but we can still be friends. <laughs> she intends to speak with us today on the subject of the federal government and local policing, but our program today is a bit of a departure from the traditional lecture. Ms. Gupta will instead engage in a conversation with two members of our faculty, Keith Findlay and Cecilia Klingel. Both are distinguished scholars and teachers who focus on criminal justice. Professor Finley is a renowned scholar and teacher in the area of wrongful convictions. Particularly relevant for us this afternoon is that he recently co-chaired the Madison Police Department's Policy and Procedure Review Ad Hoc Committee. And Professor Klingel's research focuses on criminal justice administration with an emphasis on corrections, including extensive work on community supervision. And she teaches our policing course. We could not be in better hands as they embark on this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Vanita Gupta, Professor Fidley, and Professor Klingel. We have one more group that we want to thank at the outset, and I'm going to call them out because I see a few. Would students in the role of police in a free society please stand up for a moment? <laughs> See, we have a number of them here tonight. Many um, could not join us. But we have them to thank for many of the questions that we'll be discussing tonight. They have generated them um, based on their studies. And I think that we'll all benefit um, from their thoughtful reflections. So thanks to you as well. Great. And uh, Dean Raymond, thank you for that, uh, uh, for that nice introduction. We have so much that we're really excited to talk to you about <laughs> here that um, I want to jump right in to the questions oh. so we can cover as much terrain <laughs> as we possibly can. And um, we thought we'd start by just sort of laying the foundation by talking with you a little bit about your personal and professional background. The, the dean gave us sort of the, the thumbnail sketch of your, pro, of your professional biography, but at, those are always inadequate um, by necessity, um, given the time constraints. So we'd like to dig a little deeper into your personal and professional story. And I wonder if we could start by asking you to just tell us about the path you took professionally. Um, How did you get to the point where you could do the important work that you've done? 
Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's an honor to be in Madison. When I landed, um, I was not expecting to see snow on the ground <laughs> anywhere at, the, at this moment. It was like 70 degrees in Washington, DC last night. Um, but it is an honor to be here. Dean Raymond, thank you. To the Kastenmeyer family, thank you so much for, um, for sponsoring this lecture. Um, so my, my path is, uh, I, I was in law school, had been doing a lot of work in clinics. Um, representing kids actually accused of crimes in Brooklyn, uh, in New York, and was just getting to, this was now in the late 90s, when um, really the trajectory of the country on issues of criminal justice was going in one direction, over the buildup of the, the criminal justice system of mass incarceration over a period of several decades. We were really kind of, um, kind of uh, binging, I think, on arrests and incarceration, so much so that a country, we were a country at that time that had 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population in the richest country in the world. And it exposed me to a lot about um, the courtrooms, about criminal justice, about how criminal justice was affecting young, young folks in particular. But I did that work. I then um, was inspired to go to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund founded by Justice Thurgood Marshall um, in his quest to end legal segregation in this country. You know, and at that time, at the founding of the Legal Defense Fund, uh, the organi he was leading the strategy on for, that led to Brown versus Board of Education. And I went there um, in part because it's an organization with a long history of um, fighting racial injustice uh, across the board, but in the criminal justice context, really mostly focused on the death penalty. But I went um, with a fellowship focusing on looking at um, the ways in which our drug policies had impacted uh, our incarceration rates uh, and the racial kind of disparities in our criminal justice system. And pretty soon, weeks into um, my being there, I became, I watched a documentary that had been made by two young women um, who were the daughters of a well-known civil rights lawyer in New York who told a story in 11 minutes of this documentary of a drug bust that had happened in this very small town of Tulia, Texas in July of 1999 where it's a town of 5,000 people located in the panhandle of Texas between Amarillo and Lubbock, um, a, a town with 350 African Americans, uh, where on July 23, 1999, over 12% of the town's black population was arrested uh, by a, uh, a narcotics team. Um, basically, uh, SWAT teams went to each of their homes, 46 individuals, 40 of whom are African American, the other six either white or Latino in romantic relationships with African Americans. And, um, and they, they, the, the arrest that the sheriff had had, uh, TV stations stationed outside of the local jail after the SWAT team had kind of brought in, um, was, was bringing people into the jail, caught on local TV. And just a couple of hours later, the local paper ran a news story that said, Tulia streets cleared of garbage and named all 46 individuals with their addresses and locations and their, and their charges. And I saw this documentary. Um, it, it turns out, and I'm fast forward because I'm not going into my personal story, I will, but I'm telling this story, <laughs> I'm telling this story for a reason because um, it explains everything else that I did after. Um, and so I was, uh, I learned about this case that the, the documentary was made a full two years after the sting had taken place and was telling the story um, of the fact that people initially of the 46 started to try to go to trial to establish their innocence and the first seven went to trial and in very quick order all had been accused of between one and four grams of powder of sales of powder cocaine, um, very small low level amounts. And it turned out that in the course of the trials, it turned out there was no corroboration for anything that the single police officer who had been responsible for, um, for the drug sting had been in the town for 18 months conducting these alleged buys and busts, um, had no corroboration for anything he said, but they started to receive sentences of between 20, 45, 60, 99, in one case, 341 years. These were stacked sentences. In some, a few cases, there were multiple counts. And it just, it, it was just, it was like mind-boggling, because you're like, this is a town of 5,000 people with 
th with 46 drug dealers? Like, is everyone on drugs in this town? Like, it just, the, the math didn't actually compute. And so, fast forward, I worked very, I worked, built a team, worked on these cases for two years. The media, we, we really had to turn the whole story around because the then Texas Attorney General, John Cornyn, now U.S. Senator, had given this, this police officer the Lawman of the Year Award. It turned out that he had himself been arrested for theft and abuse of official capacity while he was on the job, that he had used the N-word pervasively in this town, and that he had been supported by funding all the way up to the Justice Department in Washington to conduct um, this drug sting. It was meant one of many around the country. So I, I dug in and really spent a lot of time on these cases, became very close and attached to the families, but it required a narrative shift around what was happening in our jails and prisons. Now, obviously, um, this is a case of innocence. Fast forward, Governor Rick Perry ended up pardoning all of our clients. There was extensive hearings and a lot of, um, of media. But it really, while I understand that uh, most cases are not cases of innocence in the system in quite the same way that these cases represented, I had gotten to know this justice system in this little town really, really well and saw the degree to which without safeguards and guardrails, things could go so horribly awry and was visiting prisons and jails all over Texas during the course of these two years and was just profoundly shaken by what was happening in our criminal justice system. And so I went to, I did this work for several years. I went to the ACLU really because I wanted to change the laws. I understood the power of litigation. But for me, I thought, you know, well, we had this huge victory in Tulia. This was really the tip of the iceberg in terms of what was happening in our criminal justice system. And I wanted to help change these laws. And around 2008, I felt kind of a softening in conversations with uh, people who became were unlikely allies. So um, I remember I, having conversations with Grover Norquist about, um, about the war on drugs and, and what was happening in the criminal justice system. There were these alliances that were beginning to form between the left and the right around agreements that perhaps our system has just is it, it, it's just, it's ineffective, it has devastated communities of color, um, and that there needed to be a new way of thinking. Some folks were brought into this for money reasons, other people for moral reasons and racial justice reasons, but there was this ability to build some alliances. And so I, I worked very deeply on, on doing that work, um, and, and then uh, lo and behold, one day, get a call from, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder's office. Um, and you can imagine my surprise, because I had spent my whole life suing the government, um, <laughs> that, that they wanted me to join. Now, I got this call just two weeks after Michael Brown had been killed in Ferguson. And, um, and it was an interesting choice for the Attorney General and the President to make to ask me to head up the Civil Rights Division. I obviously had done a lot of work in criminal justice and policing um, up until that point. But I was really acutely aware that at that time, folks were so much in their corners on policing and that this, um, this issue was so polarizing in 2014, and we can, we can talk, we're gonna obviously talk about this. But I will, I spent those two years, we'll talk about the Justice Department, but that is basically how I ended up doing this work. My parents were immigrants to this country. They came in the late 60s. They never expected me to be a lawyer working. I have no lawyers in my family. I'm the first lawyer in my family. Um, and I, I think they were fairly surprised by some of my career choices, um, uh, but becoming a public interest lawyer and doing this work. But it, I've never looked back. <clears throat> Great. Wonderful. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about your work at the Justice Department. You obviously, as you alluded to, came at a really important time in the history of civil rights where public conversations, especially with respect to policing, we're beginning to change in important ways that are still ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it might be helpful to just set the stage first by talking a little bit about what the Office of Civil Rights does. I think it's a unique office um, insofar as you do both some criminal and civil litigation. Maybe you could begin by talking about the nature of the work and then how you saw your role in the office. Sure, so the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department was created in 1957 by the passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. 
Um, and it was out of a recognition that there needed to be some way that the United States government and the federal government could ensure uh, the protection of civil rights. There were very, far fewer civil rights statutes then when the, when the section was created, when the division was created, it was tiny, um, under 10 people, I think, when it was first started. Um, and the, the mission was to protect vulnerable communities and enforce federal civil rights laws all over the country. Um, we all know the context in which the division was, was created. There was a fight for voting rights that was very much alive in the country, and there were um, you know, African Americans and other uh, folks marching in the streets and leading the fight and sometimes losing their lives in the fight for voting rights in particular. Um, but that was how the division was initially created. The, most of the focus of the division's early work was in criminal prosecutions of, of violators of, um, of some of the criminal civil rights statutes that were on the books, uh, litigation against the Ku Klux Klan, um, violence that the Klan was perpetrating throughout the South at the time and the like, and that was kind of the origin story. When I was at the division from 2014 to 2017, at that time, um, the body of statutes that we were enforcing were, I think it was, um, it was closer to about 30 civil right, federal civil rights statutes. Everything from landmark legislation of the Voting Rights Act to the Fair Housing Act, uh, education, um, uh, statutes that had been enacted, the Matthew Shepard uh, and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. So there are 12 sections in the division organized around the enforcement of particular statutes um, and uh, particular issues. Uh, at the time, the staff was close to 700 uh, people, about 500 attorneys and then um, other staff doing a variety of analysis and, and support. Um, and it's a, it is the heart of the federal government's effort to protect and enforce uh, civil rights all over the country. And so um, it's a really important division. Um, and the largest section, actually, which people don't often uh, know, is the disability rights section. Um, but there's uh, the work that is done throughout that is both criminal and civil, as you said. There are, there's a lot of work that's done in individual cases to protect individual, um, protect people against discrimination as they experience it individually. But some of the most important litigation that the division does is called pattern and practice litigation. And this is litigation that is aimed at addressing systemic constitutional violations by state and local actors, um, uh, state and local government actors. And, um, and that, that litigation is often, and, or enforcement, is often the kind of um, work that really produces sweeping change in different sectors in different professions and the like. And um, it's out of the special litigation section that the Civil Rights Division does its jails, prisons, and policing work. So the, what you've just been talking about, I take it, is largely civil litigation. You've also alluded originally to some of the criminal prosecutions that you've done, and that raises a whole messy area with the, the limited jurisdiction of the federal government enforcing criminal law since most criminal law occurs at the state level. I think Cecilia wants to talk to you about that in just a moment. But before we get to that, let me just ask you a, a little bit about the civil side, um, or, or more broadly, your, 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 your objectives. Um, what, what were you hoping to achieve in the Civil Rights Division? How do you assess how that worked? And if I could just get a little bit political for a moment here, I want to get you to expand on a tweet. Uh-oh. <laughs> It's your tweet. <laughs> it's still an uh-oh. <laughs> in which I noticed that you re recently tweeted, and I'm quoting, in Chicago of all places, Trump says my administration has also curtailed the harmful and intrusive use of federal consent decrees which wrongly give meddlesome officials immense authority to tie down local police departments. It was one of Trump DOJ's worst moves. I think he's talking there about that civil enforcement that you were talking about there, and I wonder if you could just Give us more than the tweet version of what you're talking about there. Yeah, so, um, so as I mentioned, I came into the division just weeks after Michael Brown had been killed. And almost every week that I was at the division in 2014, 2015, 2016, you all were reading the newspaper, stuff was happening here. Um, there was a video of, that was going viral of officer-involved 
violence or shootings or, um, or you know, things that were happening that were really kind of charging community police relations in very polarizing ways. And, um, you know, it was a time where the Justice Department, I'll back up for a second. So the Justice Department in 1994, in the aftermath of the Rodney King beating in, in Los Angeles, Congress passed a law um, that gave a mandate to the Justice Department to investigate police departments um, where there was a, um, a substantial body of evidence around the po possibility of a pattern and practice of constitutional violations by a police department. And this is civil, this is a civil authority. The Justice Department had long had criminal jurisdiction to prosecute uh, corrections officers, police officers for violations of criminal law. And we can talk about that. It's a very, very limited jurisdiction in the, in the case of um, law enforcement officers. It's slightly broader in the case of correctional officers. Um, but the civil authority was um, has, has only been ex in existence since 1994. But the, every time that the Justice Department announced um, one of these open investigations during my time, I think I opened four, um, it was a big deal. Uh, and it was a big deal in part because the nation was really transfixed on these issues at the time. Uh, so during my time, we opened uh, in Baltimore uh, after Freddie Gray was killed. We opened in Chicago uh, and did the investigation in Chicago after Laquan McDonald. Just a couple of things about this. It would take much, much more than a single bad incident to trigger the Justice Department to open one of these. There are 18,000 police departments in this country. The Justice Department had 25 consent decrees across the nation. You wouldn't necessarily think that through some of the rhetoric that has been emerging. That is a teeny tiny fraction of, um, of police departments. It's an authority that the Justice Department use very, very judiciously and carefully. Um, policing is a terribly challenging profession. It is very, very challenging. It is, it is, um, it is complex. It, it, the Justice Department lawyers that I worked with and oversaw took a great, had a great deal of humility in doing this work and understanding how kind of charged these relationships can be. But we went into um, police departments to do these investigations where there was substantial body of evidence accumulated over sometimes years um, of constitutional violations at a more systemic level, not just at an individual level. So both in Chicago, I think there, had, we had been asked to go uh, to investigate the Chicago Police Department for over 15 years before we opened um, when we did in 2016. Baltimore was very similar. Uh, and, and in Ferguson, we, we oversaw the investigation of the Ferguson Police Department. So what the Justice Department would do, and this is just to demystify it a little bit, is um, we would have to have grounds to, to open an investigation and make sure that we had no prejudgments made. And oftentimes would spend close to a year, have a team of uh, investigators and lawyers working very heavily in that police department, interviewing not only community leaders and sometimes hundreds and hundreds of them, but also hundreds of police officers who frankly were often done a gross disservice by the lack of um, resources by the lack of accountability systems that were applied consistently by the lack of officer wellness and safety programs um, but also looking at use of force discriminatory policing stop searches and arrests um, looking at things like training and supervision and so and we would do this and then issue findings um, and if there were findings made that there indeed was a pattern in practice uh, of systemic violations we would then enter into uh, a negotiation with the city uh, to try to settle these cases with the city and create then a, an agreement, a consent decree that would be filed with a federal court so that the politics, so regardless of administration, the federal court would then oversee the implementation of a consent decree. And in policing, just like any other institution, reform never happens overnight. It can take years. There are stages of the process. Uh, we always used to say culture eats policy for lunch um, because you can create the best policies in the world and put them in place, but you have to have a lot more 
um, to really change the culture of an institution. Um, and, and so that is like to just explain what this is and, and um, what it is, and a lot of people don't really understand what that process is. So in a place like Seattle and Cleveland, I think the consent decrees in those cities are now four or five years. They are overseen with monitors, third party monitors that report to the federal court. Um, but they have been largely halted in this administration. Um, I think that it is an abdication of responsibility. The Congress gave the Justice Department the responsibility to do this work. Uh, as I said, it's a tool that is very judiciously used, but the Trump DOJ, both under um, Sessions and now Attorney General Barr, uh, have halted, I think there's been one new investigation into a police department on a very narrow issue in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, but largely otherwise the work has halted. The, when the administration changed over, uh, the Baltimore consent decree had been signed by the city and day two of the new administration, the, Justice, the Sessions Justice Department tried to go to court in Baltimore to um, get out of the consent decree. But it had already been filed with a judge who said, oh no, 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 you cannot do that. Um, and in fact, it was this weird irony that the, the Trump administration was speaking a lot about federalism and local control, but in Baltimore, the mayor and the police commissioner were like, no, 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 we need the consent decree. Um, and it was, it was like this weird juxtaposition where the local, uh, the, the, the commissioner and the local, there was a lot of local appetite to say, we, this, we need to profoundly change. There's no other way to kind of reset the relationship between the communities in Baltimore and the police department without the assistance of this consent decree. And so ultimately the judge you know, said no to the Justice Department and, um, and the consent decree is, is in, in action. So this is why I do this tweet is that um, there's been a maligning of this work. Um, a lot of it is, is a lot of heavy rhetoric without any real um, kind of understanding of the program about how important and judicious the tool has been used. Um, and I think that the setback of kind of shutting this work down right now outside in terms of new investigations um, is a real setback for the country. Can I just follow up real quickly with that? And given what you've said about what a minuscule part of the policing landscape these consent decrees and these federal, um, litig this federal litig litigation occupies, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what significance you think the, the, the federal litigation has? Um, if, it's, if it's affecting so few, how, how effective is this as a tool in changing that police culture and in, and in sort of improving the landscape of, of civil rights across the country? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why um, this, this is so important is that these consent decrees have become the basis for best practices around the country. They have informed the Police Executive Research Forum, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. They've informed the work and best practices that law enforcement associations are then adopting. They're looking to, I've been in countless meetings with, with the IACP, with PERF, with the police unions. I used to, I spent a lot of time with the Fraternal Order of Police and, um, and other police unions. Uh, and there was a real kind of digging into the consent decrees that the Justice Department had put in to kind of look at them, understand them, figure out how to kind of make this more, we don't have a national, sta our national standards are in the Constitution and the courts decide what, the con what that means um, in, in practice. We, we as a country have not adopted a national police force and so what we have are these 18,000 police departments with a broad range of practices and different demographics but these consent decrees have been the, become the basis for study and for um, adoption of best practices around the country. The leadership conference actually just this past year analyzed all of the consent decrees, analyzed research that's been put out by the International Association of Chiefs of Police and by civil rights groups and kind of amassed it and put together this big resource called, it's called a new era of public safety, really digging into what do these best practices look like, what cities are doing amazing pioneering work uh, around them uh, and, and doing that kind of thing. And so that's why um, they've had such national significance. And you know, 
civil rights, private civil rights litigators can't, they don't have the same kind of authority uh, and can't access the data in quite the same way. It can take years to litigate to get data from police departments. The Justice Department has a special kind of both bully pulpit and ability and reach and subpoena power um, to kind of dig in and get all of this and spend months negotiating and crafting with the city involving law enforcement input consent decrees to, to kind of try to transform uh, the police departments. Right. So as you mentioned and as the rhetoric around this topic suggests, principles of federalism <laughs> seem to animate people's both concerns and hopes for the role of the Justice Department um, as opposed to the concerns of local police and lo local communities. As the Justice Department approaches both investigations and the negotiation of consent decrees, what is the approach that you took to engaging local officials and what kinds of responses did you receive? Because your answer earlier suggested that maybe the reception was mixed. You know, it's interesting. I, um, so I came in after the former nominee before me to head up the Civil Rights Division had actually um, been voted down uh, because of a case he had been in. Oh, no, it wasn't even a case that he had himself had been involved in. He had been a lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and they had represented a client who had killed a police officer. Um, and by imputation, anyway, it was a, he, he was not uh, made the head of the Civil Rights Division. And so I walked in to the setting, understanding that I was coming from the ACLU, um, and but was coming in and knew and had a keen sense that policing was going to be a major focus of my time given what was happening. And I immediately reached out before I even came in to the heads of all the major policing groups, to the, to the senior officials at the FOP. Um, my, my, uh, the, the former head of the Civil Rights Division had had a very tense relationship with law enforcement. Um, and I just felt like we were not, I was not going to be able to do this job or succeed at this job without having some really open lines of communication, um, not only with police chiefs, but with, with the unions that represent police officers and that, um, that are very close to, to the problem. And, and so I did something unusual, which is, as I said, I was putting myself in rooms for, with the FOP. I would go up and I, you know, a lot of folks had a lot of feelings about the consent decrees and about the Justice Department. And I would like lay the stuff out and engage with, with them. And before we opened the Baltimore investigation, I had the union come to the Justice Department and talk to me about what they were seeing as the major issues. In fact, the Baltimore FOP had done a report just two years prior about problems in the police department and talked about the quota system around arrests that had destroyed their relationship with, with the community. And I wanted to hear about that and I wanted to make sure that we were gonna, we were gonna interview lots of police officers even as we knew that the black, black communities in, in particular two districts in Baltimore were so distrustful because of long histories of systemic violence and harassment by uh, police officers in Baltimore that they were not cooperating in, solve it, in, in, in being victims, uh, witnesses to crimes in their cases. And this was just a, it was causing a huge breakdown of criminal justice in, in Baltimore. But I, it was important for me to engage. And I, you know, I will say that as, um, the, that engagement, well, it wasn't even that the relationship was mixed. These issues were really tense, but the ability to have that line of communication continuously throughout my tenure with uh, law enforcement. Obviously, I was also, there were days where in the morning I would speak to mothers who had lost their sons to police violence uh, in a city, let's say, I remember this in San Francisco going, uh, spending the morning with four mothers who had lost their sons to police officer-involved shootings, and in the afternoon spending time with San Francisco police officers um, who were telling me about what, how they were experiencing kind of the moment and the climate, and it was like two totally different languages. It was too, it felt like, you know, there was like no place to actually begin to really dig in and to understand the, the real pain in, um, in these communities and understand the degree to which 
you know, policing is also challenging and hard, and some police officers were like, we're getting blamed for the actions of, of a few others, or like our system is broken down. And so I don't, it was, it's hard for me, it wasn't like a good or bad relationship. It was a really like engaged and involved relationship. One that actually I continue to this day um, as we do our, our work in policing. And so I don't, I think you have to take that approach. Um, uh, and you have to be able to kind of, we have to be able to really, this is why the local work to me is the most important. The federal government is not gonna solve problems in policing. The federal government has, you know, reach into just a few, but the work that happens in local communities, regardless of where the Justice Department is or isn't, and right now it isn't, um, it means that it's up to local uh, advocates people who care in Madison, Wisconsin, to, it, with the chief and with the chief's kind of team, it, like to have those places to actually engage. It's why I think it's really important that there are, that there's infrastructure that is built in local communities um, that allow for the community in a more kind of structural way, engage with police departments on policies, on priorities, on, you know, and sometimes those are community oversight boards. Those can be, I mean, there are a lot of different names that are given to this, but that ability to do this work at the local level to me is the most important and the most profound. And what worries me is without, I do think that in the Obama administration there was, there were federal dollars being put to this and to support that work, collaborative work uh, on the local level, because the cops office in, just, in the Justice Department supports a lot of the collaborative work that happens. That has all receded, <clears throat> and um, and the pressure is not there for for local um, police departments to do this. Um, they get enormous amounts of federal funding, and um, that pressure is not being put on by the Justice Department. So it's up to local leaders to really make that happen, both in 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 law enforcement and in the community. Maybe this would be a good time. Um, and I think you might want to jump in on this to, to to talk a little bit about the limited ability to bring federal criminal actions. Uh, DOJ often declines to prosecute, and I, I, I suspect a lot of it has to do with um, the nature of the federal criminal statutes, and I wonder if you could just talk about that. Yeah, so um, I had to close some cases that had, were incredibly highly charged in my time um, at the Justice Department. and. Can I just um, interrupt and ask yeah. you as a preface to this, to, if you could sort of describe the kinds of things that you're looking at for federal prosecution? Well, sure. So the federal government has one statute um, that uh, it that Congress passed. I don't actually. It was uh, it's Section 242. It was a very long time ago, requiring the highest level of intent that is required by criminal law. So it requires being able to establish that a police officer. Um, set out with the intent to violate a person's constitutional rights and did so knowingly and willfully. So that is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's kind of legally wonky, but that means that cases where a police officer may have acted recklessly or negligently will not meet the bar. You, it requires a, sub, a, a subject, it's in a subjective intent standard of willfulness. And so um, what that meant was that most cases uh, af after investigation were not going to meet that threshold. Um, the Justice Department does prosecute um, you know, many cases that do, but there are many high profile cases that all of you have heard about that where, we, where um, the Justice Department has declined because it just didn't meet that standard. And so um, it goes into being able to establish intent. It requires establishing that a police officer was actually trained um, in this particular maneuver or kind of approach and failed to follow it um, uh, intentionally. So you can see all of the ways in which um, that's how you kind of, that's how, that's what prosecutors are looking for. It's what the FBI is investigating when investigating these cases. Maybe one of my favorite questions the students generated um, was this. What would a fully reformed police department look like? <laughs> um, so there just is no such thing as a perfect police department. No, there isn't. Um, 
And I said this, I said this on, uh, I remember when we were announcing the Newark Consent Decree, PBS was doing a whole documentary about policing, and they, I think I got asked a variation of that question, and I was like, there is no perfect police department. There's no perfect hospital. There's no perfect, where like doctors are never gonna, you know, uh, there's no perfect institution. What you strive for, I think, is a police department that, um, through accountability systems, supervision systems, training systems, is, able to have the best policies in place around how do you de-escalate, what are the best practices around use of force. And at, I remember at the time that um, in 2004 and 15 and 16, uh, there, was a whole, there was a very new conversation happening or renewed conversation happening around use of force in policing. And to what degree um, are officers trained to use just too high levels of force rather than kind of being trained in de-escalation techniques using time, distance, communication to kind of de-escalate situations. Uh, and there's, you know, there are just tons of incidents that were coming to our attention around people in mental health crises that were being, you know, shot upon an approach uh, without any use of distance, time, and, and I remember, I don't, you guys may have seen in one of the videos that just has always stayed with me is out of Dallas where a mentally ill man came out. Um, her mother had called the police department. Uh, it wasn't the Dallas Police Department. It was right outside of Dallas to, to come because her son was in crisis and was um, being really belligerent. And he came to the door as the police were approaching with a screwdriver in his hand and within literally two seconds was shot and killed. And, there's, and it was caught on video, and so um, it was, it's a very disturbing video. And it, it really did, around that time, there were a lot of conversations being sparked around de-escalation and best practices and the like. And so a, pol you know, a pol police department is one that is, that is, that is constantly looking at um, how are they both kind of protecting the dignity and public safety of communities uh, engaging in the best practices that are geared towards the sanctity of, of life, but are also um, able, when, when mistakes or bad things happen, to correct and self-correct. And often what we found going into police departments was the police departments that we were going into often were not, I mean, I can say this about Baltimore because it's public, but when we went into the Baltimore Police Department, there was, none of the stop and frisk data was being, was computerized. It was literally in a room of file cabinets on paper to the extent that it was being collected. Nobody had ever studied it. They had been required through some consent decree before some private thing to start collecting some of this data, but there had been no self-studying and no ability to even identify what the issues were and then to be able to develop policies to address it. And I, that's, you know, they, it was also didn't have, they didn't have money to computerize the stuff. There had been a lack of political will to actually fund some of these systems that would help the, the department. The, the patrol cars were from the 60s and 70s, and, um, and there was like no like, um, kind of geolocation that would help police officers actually be, have more targeted enforcement approaches. And, and the officers were like, this is not helping us do our jobs either, but this is, you know, the, the ability to self-correct, um, I think, is one that kind of can distinguish some police departments from others. And leadership really matters. It matters in any institution. And the kind of what is set from the top, it matters at the Justice Department. You, like, who you are as a leader and what kind of, uh, you know, what you prioritize and what you, what the kind of tone that you set about the relationship that you want to have with the community uh, and what approach and philosophy you take, I think, d matter deeply to the success of any efforts that I've ever been engaged in in this in this regard. If you don't mind, can we can we just dig a little deeper on on the use of force issue um, that you have alluded to because that's an issue that has particular saliency these days. And um, given that you took office just following the time of the shootings of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and other civilians like that, I'm sure that was a big part of your of your agenda. Um, Although Trayvon was not a, an officer involved shooting, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, what I'm wondering is, y you've talked about the fully reformed police department as one learning from these experiences and, and changing policies and whatnot, yet your tool as a federal civil rights litigator is the constitutional standard, essentially, 
And that standard under controlling cases like Tennessee versus Garner and, and Graham versus Connor is a fairly vague standard of reasonableness under all the circumstances that doesn't necessarily take into account or require any consideration of tactical uh, maneuvers that can avoid the confrontation in the first place or de-escalation efforts or whatnot. So it sounds like what you're talking about is something that goes beyond what's merely required by the sort of the floor set by the constitutional standard. And I wonder if you could talk about your vision about what good use of force policy looks like compared to the constitutional standard and how that any gap that emerges there limits your ability to affect change as a, as a federal litigator. Yeah, so, um, you know, for, for anyone who's digging in this deep, and because um, it's, a, it's a pretty deep, uh, deep issue, but I, I actually think uh, it was really important when the Police Executive Research Forum in 2016 issued uh, this, this new guidance called 30 um, Principles for, I can't now I'm getting the, the, the title garfed up, but it was um, the 30 Principles on Use of Force, and really centering things like um, the importance of time, distance, and communication, and interactions, and, and the like. And, um, and Graham versus Connor is the case by, decided by the United States Supreme Court that set the floor for, um, for what is required in order to establish excessive use of force. And for a long time, courts have been uh, interpreting that decision um, and uh, giving enormous deference to police officers given kind of the, the kind of sudden conditions or changing um, conditions that they can be confronted with in any given situation. But what, what the conversation in 2015 and 2016 was, and I think in some places it is ongoing very much today, is that Graham versus Connor did not, was not the ceiling of what should be accepted. And that police departments should be striving to go to engage policies that kind of go beyond the Graham versus Connor standard to save lives where where they can to ensure there are, you know things like medical aid is given immediately um, uh, uh, upon a, a shooting, for instance, or that um, there like. There are some basic precepts that were in this um, 30 principles guide that were, some of them came out of consent decrees and that now the consent decrees that in Chicago and Baltimore, or the Baltimore consent decree really reflects. Um, and, and that's part of the conversation is that courts also have a role to play in, in defining Fourth Amendment standards of what is reasonable and what is unreasonable for a police department. But the, the very notion of what is reasonable, which is an inherent concept in the Fourth Amendment analysis, needs to also be informed by what police departments are defining as reasonable through training and the like. And so it matters then when there's a critical mass of police departments kind of redefining what that de-escalation de training is reasonable policy as opposed to seen as a stretch or kind of that only a few. That will, it will shape and have a feedback loop on how courts are interpreting the reasonableness standard and frankly have, I think, a profound consequence for police community relations and the use of force in these jurisdictions. And you know, there are some great examples of police departments that um, really took this on, like in Camden, New Jersey with Chief Scott Thompson and um, Chief Kathy O'Toole in Seattle, they're both, they both subsequently stepped down um, um, more newly, but they really helped it to kind of transform the landscape of thinking around use of force in their departments and redefining kind of reasonableness in that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, okay. that's great. You've talked about the importance of culture in policing um, as well as policy. And I'm interested in what you saw in the field in terms of innovation in areas like hiring and retention and promotion that you think might sort of point the way to effective police reform in the future. Um, you know, I, I've been hearing about, um, about the fact that in a lot of places right now there's been a recruitment problem for in, mm -hmm. in policing and, um, you know, I remember this really point, this was like the worst week of my tenure at the Justice Department. Um, it was the July 4th week of 2016 <clears throat> uh, when five police officers were killed in Dallas, 
um, I guess that was at the end of the week, and in the earlier part of the week, there were Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, so Alton Sterling in, in um, right side of Baton Rouge and Philando Castile in, in Minneapolis been killed, and it was just this, this horrific week of violence um, and pain in the country. And, um, and I remember then, well, wait, I want to focus me on, the, on your precise question, because I'm Culture and the sort culture. of innovations in hiring and promotion and retention. And, and I remember the Dallas chief going on TV after that and saying, like, if I understand that people are angry about policing in America and the racial injustice of, um, of the criminal justice system, but if you want things to change, come join us, right? And, and it got broadcast everywhere. And he, you know, it basically his message was like, don't just change it, try to change it from the outside. Um, certainly, the, don't do what happened in Dallas, but like, you've got to join us and, and come on the inside. And I, you know, I think that's a tough, that's a tough message for in communities where um, there's like long-standing distrust, but I, but I think there's, that's also a really powerful message of recruitment. And I have been in rooms fewer now in my current job than I obviously before where um, uh, law enforcement chief, chiefs in particular are talking about the real struggles in, in recruitment and getting um, both diverse police forces and um, ensuring that they're kind of attracting um, uh, folks into the department that live in, in the community and the like. And so I do believe that that is an important ingredient to transforming um, police community trust and relations. And I don't have the answer to that. I think that that is going to have to happen um, as you need kind of trust and buy-in and police departments require, in order to maintain public safety in these communities, they have to have legitimacy in the community and that also depends on trust. It depends, there's so many ingredients. I always used to think about kind of legitimacy and trust and safety as uh, like kind of the three legs of the, of, of the stool that's required um, in, in communities and so, it's a it's a complicated um, it's a complicated uh, set of relationships. You, you touched on this a little bit in terms of recruitment, but I think we'd be remiss if we did not address at least one other issue that probably has no easy answer. Either. I know it has no easy answer either, and that is, but it's one that's really troubling and, and of great concern to a lot of people, and that is racism. Mm -hmm. Right, racism that's reflected in everything from disparate arrest and incarceration rates and mass incarceration all the way through the system. And that's one of the things the students were concerned about and asked about also, and it, what, what can we do about that? Uh, what can we do about racism? Okay, so <laughs> does anyone else want to answer that question? <laughs> um, and if you have the answer, like you come sit in this chair. So. Um, it, it sort of follows in the same realm as, you know, what's the, yeah. the perfect police department? Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I think we have to, uh, the, to start with, just acknowledge uh, racism and name it as, as something. We have to understand um, that racism has infected our criminal justice system from, its, from the inception or founding of this country, that we had black codes and... Um, Jim Crow, and that law enforcement was seen as enforcing these unjust laws. And I remember in my time when um, uh, Jim Comey, when he was FBI director and not um, everything that su happened subsequently, gave a really poignant speech about race and policing and kind of the history of distrust. Um, uh, uh, commissioner Bratton has been really poignant uh, on this too, the former NYPD commissioner, about recognizing and acknowledging that history, um, uh, that racism has had a very profound role in shaping, um, you know, both the role of law enforcement in communities, the laws that, that law enforcement was, was enforcing, and the, and the like. <clears throat> and I don't think, I think, you know, we struggle to identify and to name it and to accept it as real. Um, and it's part of why in communities that are experiencing, um, in, in black communities and brown communities that are experiencing a very particular form of policing that we know white communities do not experience, um, 
you know, it, breaking that down and understanding how to kind of overcome that, I don't think there's an easy answer to it, but I certainly don't think you can ignore it and you can't deny it. And so, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't, I, no, no. Were there any particular tools that you sought to implement, though, to try to address these problems? Yeah, I mean, to me, everything that we are doing, that we are were doing at the Civil Rights Division, it's not just about policing. It's about understanding that in a place like Baltimore, the kind of systemic disinvestment from their, of public schools and transportation and housing led infested housing supply in Baltimore also had a profound role in shaping racism and race, racial disparities in Baltimore. And in some ways, the kind of policing issues were like the tip of the spear, uh, given the like the long-standing structural inequalities in these communities around these issues. And so, um, so we were working on those issues as well, and we were working on uh, the ways in which law enforcement communities were interacting in these jurisdictions. And I think you have to kind of, um, you have to do all of it. Um, and there isn't, I mean, if we had the silver bullet, we wouldn't be where we are of today, of course. But I, um, we have to understand that none of these phenomena is taking place in its own vacuum. We also have to acknowledge that there has been a very distinct narrative of black men as criminals and the kind of criminalization of black and brown communities that I think in some ways right now is getting worse. It's getting more expansive to immigrant communities um, as well. That that narrative, and Brian Stevenson talks much more eloquently about this than I could ever, but this, this narrative that has like really kind of pervaded our culture in, in, in ways that we don't even recognize um, is something that we have to contend with. And we have to understand that that is why you can have a country that tolerates the kinds of arrest and incarceration policies that we have. I did, I did a, um, a report when I was at the ACLU documenting the thousands of people that have life without parole sentences, meaning that they will never see the day of light ever again for nonviolent drug offenses. And there is no other country that is incarcerating people at the ages of 17 for a nonviolent drug offense and keeping them in prison for the rest of their lives. And almost bar none, they are black or brown uh, men, and, and men and women. And it is something that, you know, when President Obama initiated the Clemency Initiative, it was an effort to really reach that population, and despite that effort, and despite some sentencing reform, there remain many, many people in states and in the federal prisons that are sitting on these life without parole, because we decided to discard uh, a segment of our communities into these prisons and jails. And it isn't to say that we don't have to deal with real public safety and crime in our communities, but the degree to which we have been willing to write off uh, certain parts of our communities in our midst through over-incarceration and through an addiction to incarceration as the tool to address problems around um, you know, school discipline or um, immigration. We've kind of relied on the criminal justice system to be the answer to very complex social problems um, and, and told police, by the way, to deal with it and not given them the resources to, to kind of, why are they the first responders to people in mental, in mental uh, illness crises everywhere? And, and there are police departments now that have really transformed that and are working much more closely with the healthcare, with, with, um, with mental health providers in cities like Cleveland and Seattle now. But this is part of the entrenched issues around racism that we have to contend with, and it's why I've been gratified that since the Tulia cases that I described, when it felt impossible to imagine a world in which you would have candidates at the presidential level kind of trying to outdo themselves, trying to show that they are greater reformers than, than the other, um, we have traveled a great distance in this country. There really is much more of a, bi it was, it's like the only bipartisan issue uh, around right now is criminal justice reform at the state and, and federal level. But it's, it is out of this recognition that we went too far and we have, we have not kind of engaged in the level of transformative reform that we would get need to see 
um, to, to, I think, to be at more humane levels. But it is, it's something that has, like, we are in the middle of this change, and we will see where it takes us. We are um, experiencing historic lows in crime, despite now, finally, a, a kind of a, a lowering of crime rates around the, uh, and incarceration rates around the country, which really, I think, disentangle crime from incarceration in important ways. But it's, this is going to take a lot of work. It took us 40 years, 50 years, to kind of have this build up to get to the place where we had the levels of incarceration that we did. So change isn't gonna happen overnight, but we have, to, we have to employ different strategies. And I think in the opioid crisis, you're seeing kind of a different set, a more public health frame being brought to a, a really kind of significant crisis in this country. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why people are suggesting they're using a different frame, but I think it's important that that, and one of them being race, and it lets it, you know, and kind of who is most impacted by this, but the public health approach, I think, is one that is getting, incurring more and more kind of interest um, by, by um, stakeholders and by communities. So as time runs short, we want to end um, on hopefully a hopeful note. Uh, so you've seen lots of departments, and usually, uh, as you mentioned, the feds only get involved when there are deep problems. Uh, but I imagine you may also have seen some successes. Uh, what have you seen that seems to explain the success or transformation of departments that, that are ready for change and ready for reform? Yeah, I, I think it really is about um, a commitment to, to kind of um, justice at the local level. And it requires, it's where there are individual local leaders um, at, on all sides of this issue willing to do the hard work to come together and have the really hard conversations to look at different policies, to enact them, to understand that change isn't gonna happen overnight. And you are seeing this all over the country. I happily, you know, regardless of kind of what's happening in Washington, um, I hear examples, you know, of departments around the country that have really transformed their practices and, and have result, it's resulted in transformed relationships um, around um, public safety in communities. I think the community has to play a greater role in defining public safety and what public safety needs to look like in their communities. There needs to be more of an ability to have uh, engagement that is, as I said, kind of more permanent uh, and not in the context of a critical incident when something bad happens and uh, you realize suddenly that none of those relationships of trust had ever been built and that's when things can really go awry. But that's where I think there is a lot of, a lot of change. And as hard as this time has been, and um, it has been very hard across every civil rights vector, I, we've, we've mostly centered around policing, but there are many others I could talk about that I work on. Um, what has been gratifying is to see people in communities all over the country suddenly kind of stop taking for granted um, our democracy and what it takes to preserve um, the rule of law and, and, and democratic institutions in this country. And millions of people who never saw themselves as activists finding their place to engage in this effort, I think has been really, really important, gratifying. It's what gives me hope to get through this moment when, it, when we are so incredibly polarized. Um, and to see that kind of, not in a Pollyanna way, but that our common humanity is gonna get us through, but it is going to take us a lot of work, a lot of empathy, and a lot of real talk about what's actually happening um, in, in our communities. I just have to follow, I'm sorry, follow that up real quickly because, <laughs> because what you've just said spoke to us here in Madison because we've just completed a four year review of the Madison Police Department yeah. by a civilian committee that's made a re uh, 177 recommendations for charting the path moving forward. Our police chief, Vic Wall, is here, who's been an active participant Very with kind. us in this process. And sort of the centerpiece of that recommendation has been that the city should create an office of an independent monitor with a civilian re review board. I take it that's what you're talking about, yeah, the kind I mean, of thing you're talking about. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how that works well, doesn't work well? Well, I just, I think the action of itself and the process, and I mean, uh, in getting to that 
place, having the leadership of the department so engaged and invested in doing that and in engaging, and I'm assuming it took a lot of community members at the table yeah. too. I mean, that's incredible. Um, that That is what change is going to have to look like. And frankly, with 17 police departments, jurisdictions all over the country, um, it's that kind of leadership at the local level that is going to see us through in this in this country. And it's those stories, though, that we need to be lifting up uh, and talking about. And you need to continue to study the impacts and effects of this and what it means for communities, uh, what it means for the police officers in the department to have that kind of structure in place. And But to me, that's, that's what it's about fundamentally at the end of the day. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much.